الرحمن الرحيم أن الحمد لله نحمده أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوز عظيما أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Today we had a pretty busy schedule, Khwani traveling. Uh, some of our students, we traveled together for a dawah trip to Manchester. And we came back and we had to do a Q&A session for the Ask the Imam session. Some very interesting questions that came to us today from the community. And we also had an incident that we wanted to deal with, and that is one of our students who's trying to be a diligent student, having efforts in ijtihad. He has been coming to me for some time with some issues that have been presented to him from some of the people who he knows. Now that he's trying to practice and be upon the sunnah, people are coming to him with a number of shubahat, ambiguous affairs, trying to get him twisted and off of the way of taking the Qur'an and the Sunnah in accordance to the Salaf of this Ummah. So he presented me with some questions that I'm going to deal with today, inshallah. And these questions are centered around one of the great scholars of our time, Sheikh Muhammad Nasr al-Din al-Albani, rahimahullahu ta'ala. Now the goal and the objective here is to answer these questions and to shed light for this particular brother and other people who may be in this position and also to show that our da'wah and our call as Muslims should not be about personalities and individuals. There is no human being, no matter who he happens to be, who we can bend the rules for that person when he makes mistakes and also we have to know that everyone is prone to making mistakes. The only infallible one is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. So as we mentioned a number of times, scholars of Al-Islam, they have a high position and status in this religion. The imams of all of the madahib, Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanbali, if he is a scholar of the Sunnah, he has a high status in the religion. I mentioned in our last class that there are different categories of people in our Ummah. Good people and bad people. From the good people, from the categories that we have to respect are the Mujahideen. The Mujahideen, fi sabilillahi. We're not going to apologize to non-Muslims. We're not going to apologize to weak, cowardly Muslims about this aspect of our religion. The Mujahideen have a position in the dunya and the hereafter, unlike other people. Their women have a position, their families, unlike other people. It is 
established in the Quran and the Sunnah. From those people as well are the ulama. And the scholars of Al-Islam, their position is higher and better than the position of the Mujahideen. Allah Ta'ala has commanded us to be connected to the scholars of this religion. And whenever we start to take knowledge from people who are not scholars and we turn away from the ulama, then it is a sign of destruction and being astray. It's a sign of destruction and it's a sign of being astray. We've learned this already from some of what Imam al-Barbahari has mentioned. Issues have come up where he has advised the community with these issues. So Al-Imam Al-Albani is no doubt one of the scholars of our time, that we should be proud that we live during this time, that when we start to look around to identify ulama, he's one of those scholars. And whether we met him or we didn't meet him, nonetheless, during our time, the worst time known to Benny Adam is this time, the worst time known to Benny Adam is during this time, the question is, Okay, during the worst time, who were the scholars who were available and present during that time? People of this time, us, contemporary people, we say, Al-Albani was one of them. And we take honor in that. That's how the Muslim has to be. Even if the scholar is from the Hanafi Madhab, if he was a scholar of the Sunnah, and he didn't have bid'ah and khurafat and shirk and all of that, we're going to say that, even if we don't know him. Because we have to love the ulama. Scholars from Africa, scholars from the Arab world, scholars from Asia, wherever they happen to come from. If they're ulama, we as Muslims, we have to have a connection and a love for them and to them. That's part of being a Muslim. Now that doesn't mean though that the scholar doesn't make mistakes. But it does mean even when he makes a mistake because of his tremendous position that he occupies, even when he makes a mistake, unlike me and unlike you, he still gets a reward because of that serious position that he occupies. So, if you want to know if a person is astray, just ask him. What do you think about the scholars? If he says, there are no scholars, then no, he's on balala. He's miskeen. He's in trouble. He's in trouble. So we found recently in these last days some crazy things being said. People are going overboard. And our brother, who they said they murdered the other day, people are praising him and then other people are disparaging him and I found some people saying that this man is the Imam of the Mujahideen and he's in Jannah and so forth and so on and when you ask them what scholar said that what scholar took that a position what scholar said what you're saying they say there are no ulama there are no scholars is it possible is it possible that everybody here inshallah we want to be from the saved group that Allah prophet his prophet taught us taught, told us about the Firqa to Najia, there will always be a group of people from this Ummah on the truth, on the Haq. They'll be victorious. It won't harm them, those who go against them. They'll always be on the truth. Everyone here is, wants to be from that group. Everyone here. Is it possible you and I can be from this group and that group doesn't have scholars? It's void of scholars. And we have young people who think and understand this way. That I'm from the Firqa to Najia. I love Islam. I want Islam. I want the Izz of Islam. I don't like kufr, I don't like apologizing. I don't want this thing that these people are trying to shove down on my throat. I'm going to fight them back. We have people who are like that. But I'm on it by myself, me and my friends. Scholars are not with us. No, if anyone's going to be on the truth, it's going to be the scholars of Al-Islam. So the scholars, they make mistakes. But even when they make mistakes, they still get a reward. They still get a reward. Now, first thing that I want to tell my brother Uwais Al-Qarani, Uwais al-Qarani, this is his issue, Uwais al-Qarani, and you other brothers, don't spend time and don't waste time with issues like this. You're practicing, you're trying to be a student, don't waste your time with these types of issues. People want to argue and debate with you all the time. You have bigger fish, fish to fry. You have some big fish to fry. And these issues are a distraction. And a lot of times, the people who you're talking to, a lot of times, they don't want to hear the truth. A person like Al-Albani, the people are polarized concerning him many times. You have the people who extremely hate him, and you see the way they understood what he said, and then you have the other people who love him extremely, and that's also unacceptable. If I don't take his position, if I don't agree with his position, then you get upset with me? 
No. You have to be in the middle. You have to be in the middle. So we want to deal with these 10 questions that Brother Uwais al-Qarani brought to us. And there's a far-reaching implication here. It's not just these issues that we're trying to get through and to get to. It's showing you brothers how we have to be with these types of issues and with the ulama and with one another even. The first issue that these people bring in their criticism of Al-Albani is that he prevents women from wearing gold jewelry. Just like that, the question came to me. He prevents women from wearing gold jewelry. It's not Al-Albani's position to prevent women from something that Allah has allowed. It's not his ability or anyone else's ability. Qul, man harrama zinatullah allati akhraja li ibadihi wa tayyibati min al-rizq. Qul hi lilladhina amanu fil hayat al-dunya khalisatan yawm al-qiyama. Say to them, ya Muhammad, who is it that will make haram on the people? The good things that Allah has made halal for them. Tell them that these good things are for his servants. Everybody in the dunya. And Yom al Qiyamah, they're just for the believers. So you can't come and you can't make Pepsi Cola haram, Coca Cola haram. Why is it haram? Because Jews, they manufacture these. You can't do that. You can't do that on the people. You can't make Gucci jeans haram. You can't make the designer shades haram. Why is it haram? It's resembling the kuffar. You, you can't do that. Kuffar Quraysh used to do that. They used to make halal and haram as they wanted, to, as they saw fit. They would make certain fools haram for their women, certain things haram for the slaves, certain things haram for the non-Arabs, certain things haram for everyone who wasn't Quraysh. And Allah mentioned ayat. Don't do that. Halal and haram is only for Allah. So Allah's Prophet Sallallahu got on his member, and in one hand he had gold, in his other hand he had silk, and he said, verily, these two items are haram upon the men of my community. So men don't wear silk and men don't wear gold. So we understand from that, women can wear silk and women can wear gold. And women used to wear silk and you women used to wear gold during the time of the Prophet So if Al-Albani made gold haram upon women, he would be committing a big, a big sin in Al-Islam. A big sin. So the way they put the question, he prevents women from wearing gold jewelry, is not correct. But what Al-Albani was famous for doing is... He said it was impermissible for women to wear gold that's in a circular shape. That's what he said. That a woman can't wear a circular bra bracelet, a circular bangle. She can't wear something that is in the shape of a circle. That's what he said. And that's his ijtihad. If he got it wrong, which I think he got it wrong, I think he got it wrong. If he got it wrong, he still gets a reward. And if he got it right, he got two rewards. Now, the other important issue here is, and we move on to the next point. The other important issue is, Al-Albani, in all of the opinions that he took, he never was the only one who said that. And he used to warn the people, and we repeated this a number of times to our community, you young brothers, all of us, beware of taking an opinion that you don't have a scholar who preceded you to that opinion. Our brothers from the Muhajirun, Hizbut Tahrir, these guys, when you see them talking about different aspects of the religion, they're coming up with new terminology. When you ask them, who, who before you came up with those words, with that phrase and that idea? They're not going to say any scholars, new stuff. Those new ideas that you come up with, they need to be avoided because it would imply, it would imply that you have some special, unique knowledge that the scholars didn't know about. So Al-Albani never took a position except that there were people who preceded him in that position. And when he talked about this issue, he brought those positions of those scholars. I think he got it wrong, but he had ulama before him. So if you're going to hate him for this issue, then you should hate those other scholars. And that's the point. So we have to correct it. It's not the way the people are saying it. 
Second issue, Juan Ian, I'm not too interested in getting down. What is his proof and what are their proofs? That's not the point. If you want to find that out, you go and you deal with that. He has the book, Kitab al-Zafaf, uh, the, the etiquette of getting married. He brought his point of view. He was refuted. And al bani was refuted by one of the students of knowledge, is one of the sheikhs of Egypt. His name is Abu Abdullah Mustafa al-Adawi. He refuted al bani in this issue and put a book, one of the strongest books in this regard. It didn't have the best etiquette in it, didn't have the best adib, adib in it, but he still brought his prose. Another student of knowledge, younger than Al Albani, Murad Shukri, went and debated Al Albani in this issue. In the famous tape, they were debating about the issue. They don't accept that. You don't have to accept that. But to lie and to misconstrue is not fair. And number two, and number two, if we were people who had a minhaj in our knowledge, we would know the man was preceded in this particular issue as he was in all issues. Second issue the brother brought from his friends, relatives, whoever they happen to be, is that Al Albani prohibits people from fasting on Saturday. He prohibits people from fasting on Saturday. Again, this is a point where he has proof, and I agree with this proof of his. The Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not Al Albani, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't fast on Saturday except in what is wajib upon you. So Saturday is in Ramadan, fast. If you miss days in Ramadan and then outside of Ramadan you want to make up your days and it's Saturday, fast. You took an oath, I'm going to fast this day that day and it's Saturday, fast. No problem. No problem. If you killed someone, hashallah, you made the har, you swore, you told your wife you like my mother's back, you did something where you have to fast, no problem, Saturday comes fast because it's wajib upon you now. But if the day of Ashura is on Saturday, if the day of Arafah is on Saturday, don't fast. People, they find it very difficult. How are we going to let Ashura pass? How are we going to let Arafah fast and all of the virtues in that? There's a hadith that said, don't do that. There's a hadith. Now, not all scholars agree with that point of view. Some of the scholars said, listen, the Prophet وسلم, allowed us to fast on Saturday. In that, he said, don't fast on Friday unless you fast the day before, Thursday and Friday. If you want to fast Friday, you have to fast Thursday and Friday or Friday and Saturday. But you just can't wait and fast Friday because the prophet said don't do it there's no difference he said don't fast on Saturday somebody says but what about a person who wants to fast on Friday now he can fast on Saturday okay since there were prohibitions that say don't fast on Friday by itself if you don't fast Thursday and you fast Friday Saturday is wajib upon you now to fast so it's his point of view it has his delil why does a person criticize a Muslim for such an issue. Why? Because it's not fair. It's the polarization that we have in regards to personalities. Don't go overboard in your love for people. Don't go overboard in your hatred for people. Why would a Muslim be, be criticized for that position? If you came and you proved this hadith is weak because of A, B, C, D, no problem. He says it's authentic. I say that it's authentic. We have bigger fish to fry now. The third point for our brother Uwais al-Qarani and the people who came to him is that Al-Albani prohibited people from making itikaf in any masjid except one of the three masjids. The only place you can make itikaf is one of the three masjids. But in the month of Ramadan, you can't make itikaf in Green Lane, you can't make itikaf in Masjid al-Rahmah, you can't make itikaf in Sinchu Mosque, you can't make itikaf in Masjid Quba, in Medina, and so forth and so on. Again, he has a hadith that says that. Some people agree that the hadith is authentic. He said that the hadith is authentic. Others said that it is weak. So he has a delil. He has a proof. And if a person, if a person makes his position based upon a proof, even if that proof turned out to be wrong and he went about it the correct way, you can't blame him. Especially if he's a mujtahid. Whether he's Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, or Hanbali is irrelevant. If he came to that conclusion 
based upon a minhaj that is knowledge based you cannot blame him you have to respect that he tried that's why he's a scholar even the regular person the regular person is trying to do the right thing he doesn't like innovation he doesn't like shirk he doesn't like hocus pocus he's trying he arrives to a conclusion based upon efforts and sincerity he made efforts and he was wrong he's a human being you can't say he's a deviant you can't say he hates Islam. You can't say he's an enemy of the truth. You can't say he's weird. You can't say that. What about the scholars? It's even, it's even worse. So there is a hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, he said, la itikafa. There's no itikaf except in the three masajid. That's an authentic hadith. So authentic. Some of the companions agreed with that. Some of the companions disagreed with that. So the companions who agreed with it, and the Bani is on his side, on their side. Those who don't agree with that, you're on their side. Why the hatred? Because it has something to do with desires. It has something to do with not an Albani and the fact that the issue is right or wrong. It has everything to do with his minhaj, a salafiya, and a sunnah. This person's way is taqlid. His way is closing in his eyes. The sheikh, his sheikh said, only his sheikh. But then over here, when he finds a man who is going to make ijtihad and he has love for the sunnah and he tries to spread the sunnah, that's his, this is where the problem lies. And that's why I say, Uwais al qarni and the rest of you brothers, don't waste your time with these types of people. And I don't mean that those people are scum. I'm just using that word. They're trash. They're irrelevant. I'm not saying that. But they will waste your time. These people are on some taqlid stuff. Blind following, that's it. And also, beware of the other people who everything al Albani said and that's it. I find that a disturbing phenomenon. We don't make it permissible for people to blindly follow the four imams of the Medhabs, but then we're going to turn around and make them follow al Albani. We're going to make them follow everything al Albani said. Everything Sheikh Rabir said, you must follow it. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you. What kind of deen is that? What kind of deen is that? If we can take that deen and cut his head off, we would do it. But we can't. Figuratively speaking, we would like to cut the head off that understanding of Al-Islam. That Bani doesn't deserve to be blindly followed. Now, if you're an ignorant person, you're ignorant, you're jahil, you're ignorant. And you like Al-Bani's position and you go with that and you blindly follow, you can do that. You can do that. I'm of that opinion. Just don't impose it on other people and don't argue and don't debate. Just do what you do and be quiet because you're ignorant. You're not in a position to argue his proofs and your proofs and why he said and what he's saying and how to push it back. Just be quiet. Blindly follow and don't say anything. Now some people say Abu Sama blind following is not permissible. I believe it is under certain conditions. Are we going to fight each other over that issue? It's all about the minhaj is sahih and given knowledge and what we are upon the next point khwani number four those three masajid that this hadith are referring to masjid in mecca the masjid in medina the prophet's masjid sallallahu alaihi wasallam and bayt al-maqdis those are the only three places when there's itikaf in this masjid i never give any announcements for it i never do anything to help that situation I respect that the Masjid administration has another point of view, so they do it. That's their point of view, no problem. But I'm not going to help it. I'm not going to help it. But am I going to be at odds with them? And I'm not going to give the khutbah. And I'm going to boycott the other khatibs in our masajid. I'm going to call them and say, listen, Zakat Allah, Abu Muhammad Abdul Kareem, all of you people, we need to get a, a khatibs union. Let's get a union and go on strike until they stop these people. That's their point of view. It's their point of view. There is etiquette in ikhtilaf. And who are you? And who am I? We don't have authority and power over people. You say your opinion, you keep it moving. The next position or the next point, Khwani, is Al Albani allows breaking of the fast before Maghrib. Now, in not being extreme and overboard, I'm inclined to take offense to this and to get upset and say, Al Albani didn't say that. But I know as a human being, human beings can say anything and human beings can do anything. Any and everybody here can say and do anything. This is my friend, this is my man, I know him. 
someone comes and says, man, he stole my money. As an example, he stole my money. I'm not going to say, well, Lord, he may I die as a Jew. He didn't steal your money. I wasn't there. I say, look, I don't think that man stole your money. That's my man. I know him very good, and I don't think so. And if he did, something is going on. He's, something is happening, but I don't think so. I'm going to defend his honor. But, wallahi, let's do mubahala. You and me. I swear by Allah, may Allah cause me to die as a kafir that he didn't do it. Now you do the same. I'm not going to do that. From the minhaj of the people of the past is that you do not bear witness for anything that somebody else does. Anybody who's living, he can be a Muslim today, a kafir tomorrow. On the sunnah today, and he can be tomorrow an innovator. Everybody, your mother, your father, your sheikh, everybody. So be balanced. I doubt it very seriously that Al Albani said that you can break your fast before Maghrib. I doubt that very seriously. If it was true, it had been well known. It's a classic case. It appears here that people are taking the situation out of context. They add it, they subtract, or they just misunderstood. They just misunderstood. mur, and the sweetest of the possibilities is sour, because he's a scholar. The sweetest of these possibilities is sour. If Al Albani or anyone else other than Al Albani just like the gold. If he said that it was permissible for a person to break his fast before Maghrib, that is a ruling that can take you outside of the religion of Al-Islam. Because you're making halal what is haram. And you're not making a small thing halal that's haram. You're making a big thing. One of the pillars of the religion. Fasting is a rukun from the arkan. And you're telling someone you can do it in this type of way. And it clearly goes against what Allah Ta'ala commanded in the Quran. فَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمْ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَدُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ Eat and drink until the two threads are distinct from the Fajr time. At that time, stop eating. And then at the Maghrib time, that's when you eat again. Everyone knows that. That's the ijma of the Ummah. So we never said that. What Al-Bani said, I believe that these people are getting twisted is that the Muslim community has to not rely on the, the timetable. The timetables are different. There are those timetables that tell you to stop Suhoor 30 minutes, 45 minutes before Fajr. And there are those timetables that are saying Salat al-Maghrib is at different times in the same city. And sometimes they're up to 45 minutes apart. Sometimes they're up to 45 minutes apart. And I recall that some people, their timetable was correct. Their timetable was correct. But the questioner was asking Al Albani about an incorrect timetable, which if the people, if the people were following that timetable, would have been a problem. So he was saying to the people that you have to break the fast when the sun sets and not at the timetable. And not at the timetable. That person turned around and said that Al Albani was saying you can make this thing happen. That's not fair and that's not just. That's not justice. That's not justice. So he never said that. And if he said that and it was proven, we're going to free ourselves from Al Albani in this regard. We're going to free ourselves from this, from this issue. And Ikhwani, for your information, as we've mentioned in this masjid, there are other scholars who are much bigger than Al Albani from the companions and from the tabi'een who gave rulings that were problematic that were bigger than this bigger than this in terms of the ramifications but you know that that companion he didn't mean it like that the companion who said that you can drink khamar he thought that that was okay a companion used to eat ice abu talha used to eat ice in the month of ramadan and he said, ice doesn't snow, doesn't break your fast. Doesn't, it's not food. That was his ijtihad. He's a companion. Are you going to come and say, no, he made a mistake in that particular issue. Radi Allah anhu. That's established. It's a classic case of a scholar making a mistake in his ijtihad. And we say, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him for that particular thing. And give him his reward because he's a scholar, he's a companion. Now you're going to come and say he encouraged the people to break their fast and to have proper meals. That was his ishtihad. He was in a place, never saw 
snow before, snow came down, he got it and started eating it in the month of Ramadan. That's Thabit. For our brother Uwais al Qarani, Akhwani is the fifth point, or the, yeah, the fifth point. Al Albani allowed people to eat after dawn in the morning for the one who is fasting. Yes, he did do that. He did it because the Prophet allowed it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا سَمِعَ أَحَدَكُمْ النِّدَاءُ وَالْإِنَاءُ فِي يَدِهِ فَلَا يَدْعُهُ حَتَّى يَقْدِيَ حَاجَتَهُ If one of you, in the month of Ramadan, or when you're going to fast, the Prophet said, if you're sitting there and you're eating, and the adhan goes off and you have the cup in your hand and you're drinking and the adhan goes off. He said, don't put that cup down until you finish. Don't put that cup down until you finish. Because it wasn't your goal, it wasn't your objective to eat and drink at this particular time. You woke up late today, but you started eating your porridge, you started drinking your tea, and then the adhan went off. Your clock in your house, you started hearing the adhan, the adhan outside started to go off the prophet allowed you sallallahu alaihi wasallam to continue to drink and to eat what you have provided it's not a lot it's not a full course meal you have that food there before you and you still have some eggs left over and the adhan went off you can continue to eat and not worry and not worry and similar to it is what the companions used to do at maghrib time they would start to break their fast at maghrib in their house and they would start the salat and the companion would sit and calmly continue to eat his food and miss a rakah and miss a second rakah and then go and calmly go to the masjid because he had a reason to do what had happened. When you don't have fiqh, you, you find these things hard to understand. That's the ease that Allah gave us. Some people, Ikhwani, when your religion is the madhab, the religion is the madhab. That's it. It's just the madhab. When people hear these things, even though the companions did it and other scholars, many of them, even some from their madhab, agree with it, they find it very difficult to understand, to accept. It's just amazing. What? The event of fudget is going off and you're still eating? And you believe that's permissible? You are a murtad. You've apostated from the religion. No one in his right mind... Yeah, he, relax, relax. I went to my class in London on Thursday, and it's my best class because it's messed the Sunnah, the Somalis, about 30 of them memorize the Quran, and they're really serious students. At the Adhan time, many of them fast on Thursdays, and they have their food on the side. And one brother, he went out and he brought some food. He didn't eat with the Jamaat. He was in the office with me. He was eating his burger and his fries. And the adhan went off and he was eating very quickly. Just eating very quickly. You're not enjoying your food like that. You're not enjoying your food like that. And Allah doesn't want that from you. The Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the person who has to go to the bathroom, he has to go to the toilet, Akramakum Allah, has to relieve himself. Urine or other than that. Don't hold that in and pray like that. Don't hold that in. Because while you're praying, that's what you're thinking about. You're not into the Salah. He also said, don't, if the food comes, sit down and eat it. And the people are praying. Sit down and eat at your leisure and take your time. You don't have to gobble the food up. Allah doesn't want that from you. Allah wants you to pray to him and you are thinking about what you're doing. And he gave you this ruqsa. And he loves when you take advantage of the ruqsa. He loves it when you don't fast and you're traveling. He loves it when you combine your prayer and you, your travel. He loves it. You have a reason to sit there. He loves it when it's raining and you don't come to the masjid. Allah loves that just as he hates it when you do something haram. He hates when you do haram. And he loves it when you take from him his sadaqah that he gave to you. Don't make it difficult. Don't make it difficult. So concerning this issue, there is a hadith that allows you to do this. And that's the fiqh that we love. The fiqh of the sunnah. And it is true, ikhwani, and we have to mention this. On one extreme are the people who are rigid on the madhab and taqlid. And on the other extreme are the people who take these issues and they make their religion strange as well. They make their religion strange as well. 
I wouldn't advise. I wouldn't advise. From the sunnah is, when we're praying the salah and the imam goes into rukur, you come into the door and the people are in rukur. You come into that door. The prophet allowed you to say Allahu Akbar and then go into rukur and walk and you're in rukur. And the people are in rukur and you're walking in rukur. Do I look funny doing this? And then when they come up, you come up. And by the time they go into sajda, you'll be in the line and then you go into sajda. And you have caught that raka. It happened with the companions. And then when the man who did it with Abdullah bin Mas'ud, when he did it with him, that man got ready to get up after salat was done. He got ready to get up to complete the one he thought he missed. Abdullah bin Umar, Abdullah bin Mas'ud pulled them down and said, you have the raka. This is what the Prophet allowed us to do. But I wouldn't advise you to do that in a masjid of taqlid. I wouldn't advise you to do that with people who don't know fiqh because it's going to be a fitna for them. So these issues we have to take into consideration. The environment and the people that we're dealing with. So don't follow these issues. In doing these issues, you have to do it in a way taking into consideration your environment. Your environment. People don't know when shaitan comes to you that you turn to the left and you spit. People don't know that. People don't know that. So you have to be careful of when and where you do these types of things. So we don't come with a religion that people look at us as being strange. Two extremes. Those who reject and those who enjoy these types of things. Next one, number six. Khwani Al-Albani prohibits people from, from praying the Fard prayer for a person who missed it on purpose. The Asian people, they call it Qaza. Arabic is Qaza. You know the prayers that you intentionally didn't pray? You were young, 18, 19, 20, and you didn't pray them? Ever. Or right now, we let the prayer come and it goes. The time comes and it goes. I'm going to make it up. And Al-Bani was of the opinion you can't make that prayer up. Because there's no delil to allow you to make a prayer that came and left. There's no delil. There are proofs to allow you to make up fasting, to make up hajj. There are proofs for that. But for the salat, the one who lets the prayer come and go, there's no proof to allow you to do that. How did the Prophet ﷺ not address an issue like that? It doesn't exist. You shouldn't do it. That's his opinion. And that's the opinion of the majority of the ulama of Islam. And it actually is a preventive measure from people being lackadaisical in the salat. If he feels he can let it go and make it up at any time, that's what he'll do. If he knew this is something, you'll never get it back. That's something you'll never get it back. He'll have more eagerness to do it. There's no proof for it. No proof for it. So what do we do? If a person allowed the prayer to come in and it went out and he didn't pray it because of his job or something, he has to make toba to Allah for falling into the second biggest sin in Islam, abandoning prayer, bigger than murder. Bigger than murder. It's from the Akbar al-Kabair. He has to make toba to Allah Azza wa Jal, and then he has to make as many nawafil prayers as possible. He has to pray in Ramadan Taraweeh and as many prayers that he can possibly make. As for qada, if you were to ask someone, bring me the dalil to make qada. Now, in all honesty and justice, there are some scholars who said, no, you can make qada, but they give you intellectual arguments. Intellectual arguments, they have their place in the deen, but not when it is in the absence of the delil. So he's not by himself and he has a reason for saying that. Where's the justice? Where's the fairness? The other issue, Ikhwani, and we're going to speed this up a little bit, is that he allowed the woman who was on her menses to touch and to recite the Quran. Again, I repeat, Al Albani was a scholar who didn't take a position that other scholars didn't proceed him to. There is a scholar from Andalus, we mentioned his name so many times, Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi. He was an ignited fire, a burning, blazing fire against people of Taqlid and the people of the Madahib who would take the positions of the Madhab, 
when it was clear the Medhaps were going against the Delil, and then the people were making excuses of why they should still follow the opinion of the Medhab, although it was crystal clear that the position of all of the Medhabs were wrong in this issue or that issue or this mas'ala and that mas'ala. And this thing about the lady reading the Quran and touching the Quran on her minces, Akramakumullah, Al Imam Ibn Hazm, he destroyed the position of the people who are against this. He brought the, 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 the flaming meteors against that, blew it out of the water. Their position, their proofs, their point of view. So he took that position that it is permissible, and other than him, took that position that it's permissible with Delil. So why is he the only one? I'll tell you why. Again, where we come from, Pakistanis, Afghanis, Bangladeshis, Africans, now I'm African, I'm not picking on you, I'm African. Where we come from, the woman's period is a big thing. It's a big thing. It's not a small thing. So when you tell someone who doesn't have knowledge, not exposed, you tell them, you know, when the woman is in this state, she can read the Quran. The love that people have for the Quran is like, what? Are you crazy? Are you crazy? Do you know what the period is? Yes, the same thing that the prophet said to Aisha. That's what the period is. He was making it to Kath. He told Aisha, give me a comb. Give me a comb out of the house. She said, I'm on my period, Ya Rasulullah. He said, is your period in your hand? Is your period in your hand? No, it's not in your hand. So why can't you touch the Quran? Why can't you make the dhikr of the Quran? And there are proofs that allow it. So his opinion is not an individual an individual point of view or unique position. It's a position that has delil. You may disagree with it. There was a time in Khwani I started to hesitate in this issue due to some proofs. Due to some proofs. And they're still there in the air a little bit. But I don't think that they're as strong as this position. And I respect that point of view. And I respect it not because just scholars have it, but that's part of the fitrah of the Muslims. That's just part of the fitrah of your mother, your auntie, your grandfather, that's just how the Muslim live. Why? Because cleanliness is half of the deen. And the Quran described the woman's minces, ayyamakum, as a adha. It's a hurt to them. It's not something easy. It's not something easy. So it's the fitrah, people naturally. But this deen is based upon, it's based upon proofs. It's not based upon those types of issues. Although we can understand why people act like that, but it doesn't make halal, haram, haram, halal. It doesn't legislate in the deen. Number eight, whoever travels to the prophet's grave thinking he'll do intercession is misguided. That's what Al Albani said. And he spoke the truth. In his book, At Tawassul, one of the most beneficial books, Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah was of that opinion. It's not permissible to leave Birmingham to travel to the grave of your grandfather back in Mirpur. That's not permissible. Your need is, I'm going from here to go to my grandfather's grave. That's not permissible. You can have the need, I'm going from here to visit my relatives in the village, and then from there I'm going to go see the grave, just that's part of my going there, but my need is to visit the village and my relatives, to sort out my money and my land. That's permissible. But the need to visit the grave? This rihla in al-Islam is not permissible. Because of the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi la yashuddu rihal illa il illa 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 thalatha, thalatha masajid. It's not permissible for you to make preparations to go on a trip with the intent of doing something like ibadah like this except to one of the three masjids. And when you have the niyad of going to the Prophet's masjid, that's what your niyad is, his masjid. But while you're there, while you're there, you're going to go to Quba. You're going to go to the Mount Uhud. You're going to go to the Baqir where the companions are buried outside of his masjid. You're going to go to the graveyard of the Shuhada of Uhud. And you're going to obviously go to his masjid, to his grave as well. Obviously. But if your niyyah is, I'm traveling from here to go see him, then that is misguidance. That is misguidance. And this misguidance, Ikhwani, has affected some of the people of the Sunnah. 
in that now they are telling us if you go to Mecca and you don't visit Sheikh so and so, if you go to Medina and you don't visit Sheikh so and so, then your Salafi is in question. That's the kalam of the Sufis, Khwani. It's the kalam of the Sufis. You don't have to visit anyone's house in Mecca and Medina from the people of knowledge or other than that. You don't have to visit any grave. And you definitely don't have to go to Mount Hira where the Prophet used to go, Sallallahu Alaihi and Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Nabi Khala came down. If you want to do that as a tourist, you just want to see, not getting close to Allah, you just want to see what happened. What did he go through? How was it? That's okay. But to climb the mountain and you get up there and you face the Qibla or the sun and you start making dua, there's no ibadah in that regard. No ibadah. We're almost done here. Number nine. Whoever carries the dhikr bead, then he is misguided. Whoever carries the dhikr beads. I don't know, Ikhwani, if Al Albani said that, that he's misguided. I know that he said using the dhikr bees is an innovation, but just because someone has dhikr bees, he's misguided. Then many of us are misguided. Because we'll see the Vithika bead on the mirror of someone's car who we have position with them, one of our relatives. So we take the Vithika bead off and we keep it with us and we take it with us, we're misguided. Whoever carries the Vithika bead, I'm thinking that they're referring, whoever has the Vithika bead, then this is an innovation. Not everyone who does Vithika beads is misguided. And I believe this is correct. Although there are some scholars who took the other position. And Imam Suyuti wrote a book trying to defend the permissibility of the sibha and his proofs are weak his ahadith are weak the positions are weak but nonetheless he's a scholar at his ijtihad a sheikh ibn baz was of the opinion if a person is old if a person is old and he has problems counting and keeping up and he wants to use one of those you know those number things one two three four five. he said you can do that if he had every reason for it. If Al-Bani was saying, no, you shouldn't do it at all. It's from what the Christians have. It's from what Allah didn't legislate. And it's from what the Prophet dealt with, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's what the deviants from this religion were doing when they used to make counting their dhikr with bees like that. So it seems like the haqq is with him. But again, he's not the first one to say it. Lastly, Khwani, lastly, Shaykh Al Albani said that we should demolish the green dome that's over the Prophet's masjid and that we should take this off of his masjid. And this is where the brother has the biggest issue about all of this. The green dome that's over the Prophet's masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, is like many of the other issues that have crept into his masjid the Arabic on the wall, the way that the thing is on the old portion of the masjid, where we come from in America, you know, Puerto Ricans, Puerto Ricans, come from like by Cuba, down by Florida. When it comes to color coordination, they're very colorful. Like us Africans, we're very colorful. And thus we wear these colors like this, we're colorful. The Turkish people used to be like that. All of these colors and all of this opulence, glitter, catch the eye, make people look at the situation. So the Turkish people, they made the Prophet's masjid like that. They wrote Allah's names, they wrote ayat, they painted it, they did all of this stuff, and they beautified the masjid. And that's from the signs of the hour that the Prophet told us about, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the signs of the hour. And they put over his masjid the green dome. So usually if a channel is a Sufi channel, if the masjid is a Sufi masjid, they'll show you that green dome. They'll show you that green dome. That's one of the ways you can identify Sufi, Sufi, the green dome, like the green turbans and stuff. There's something, this is something that shouldn't have been placed there. Compromises the idea, the, the, the place altogether, compromises it. And that's his position, that's the position of other scholars. So now the question is, why don't the scholars knock it down right now? Probably be a bigger fitna to knock it down right now. That's his opinion. I agree with that opinion. Shouldn't be, it shouldn't have been put there. I agree with that opinion. 
Why is our religion and our love and our hate for a person, against a person, it rests upon this? Why is that? Why is a person looked at as being a deviant, evil, doesn't love Rasulullah because of that position? That's ghulu, and that's going overboard. So the point, the goal, the objective of all of this kalam, khwani, is for our brothers and all of us, don't go overboard in people. Don't go overboard in sheikhs. Open up your minds to the delil, to the proofs. And when the proofs established, they are established, go with the proof wherever it goes. Go with the proof wherever it goes. Whoever likes what you're doing, alhamdulillah. Whoever doesn't like what you're doing, that's their problem, alhamdulillah. Go with the proofs wherever they take you. Whether that's in Allah's names and his attributes, or whether that's in the fiqh and the ibadat of al-Islam. Lastly, brothers on the sunnah, don't make your ibadah and your religion strange to the people unnecessarily. Don't make it strange to the people unnecessarily. In our masjid, we have to take it easy, even in this masjid. You do the one taslim, assalamu alaikum, that used to cause problems in this masjid. Should never be a problem in a masjid of alul hadith, never. Because you should be able to present the delil to the people. The people see it, they say khalas. But it's not what we're used to. So if the people are not used to it, it may be better not to do it. But I think with young brothers instituting the sunnah, giving dawah to the sunnah, showing the people the sunnah, people coming who are guests, they're not aware of the sunnah, pulling to the side, being good examples for the people, it makes it that much easier for people to accept and to embrace. So what your grandfather didn't do this? So what your medhat doesn't do that? But I don't think we should do this with the goal and the objective of being people who are strange. And you're going to be strange anyway, because that's what the Prophet said about the Ghuraba, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So may Allah have mercy and bless Al-Imam Al-Albani and put him in the Jannah to the Firdaus, along with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for verily he spread his sunnah, and only Allah knows what is Al-Albani's ill result. And may Allah Ta'ala put us on the way of all of the ulama, the ulama of the sunnah, irregardless of what madhab they were upon, provided that they were people of the sunnah. And those other scholars and the other Muslims, may Allah forgive us for our mistakes and our indiscretions. And may subhanahu wa ta'ala take us by our four locks and establish upon the kalima of at-tawhi and the haq. We're going to stop here, khwani, with no questions, inshallah ta'ala. And let me just see real quick. I need you to bear, bear, bear patiently with me one minute because the people in the message were supposed to contact me. They didn't. They didn't contact me. 